must have been some imp of the perverse, or some sardonic pull from dark hidden sources, which made me change my plans as I did. I had long before resolved to limit my observations to architecture alone, and I was even then hurrying towards the square in an effort to get quick transportation out of this festering city of death and decay. But the sight of old Zadok Allen set up new currents in my mind and made me slacken my pace uncertainly. I had been assured that the old man could do nothing but hint at wild, disjointed, and incredible legends, and I had been warned that the natives made it unsafe to be seen talking to him. Yet the thought of this aged witness to the town's decay with memories going back to the early days of ships and factories was a lure that no amount of reason could make me resist. After all, the strangest and maddest of myths are often merely symbols or allegories based upon truth, and old Zadok must have seen everything which went on around Innsmouth for the last 90 years. Curiosity flared up beyond sense and caution, and in my youthful egotism I fancied I might be able to sift a nucleus of real history from the confused, extravagant outpouring I would probably extract with the aid of raw whiskey. I knew that I could not accost him then and there, for the firemen would surely notice and object. Instead, I reflected, I would prepare by getting some bootleg liquor at a place where the grocery boy had told me it was plentiful. Then I would loaf near the fire station in apparent casualness and fall in with old Zadok after he had started on one of his frequent rambles. The youth said he was very restless, seldom sitting around the station for more than an hour or two at a time. A quart bottle of whiskey was easily, though not cheaply, obtained in the rear of a dingy variety store just off the square in Elliott Street. The dirty-looking fellow who waited on me had a touch of the staring, Innsmouth look, but was quite civil in his way, being perhaps used to the custom of such convivial strangers, truckmen, gold buyers, and the like, as were occasionally in town. Re-entering the square, I saw that luck was with me, for, shuffling out of Payne Street around the corner of the Gilman House, I glimpsed nothing less than the tall, lean, tattered form of old Zadok Allen himself. In accordance with my plan, I attracted his attention by brandishing my newly purchased bottle, and soon realized that he had begun to shuffle wistfully after me as I turned into Waite Street on my way to the most deserted region I could think of. I was steering my course by the map the grocery boy had prepared and was aiming for the wholly abandoned stretch of southern waterfront which I had previously visited. The only people in sight there had been the fishermen on the distant breakwater, and by going a few squares south I could get beyond the range of these, finding a pair of seats on some abandoned wharf and being free to question old Zadok unobserved for an indefinite time. Before I reached Main Street I could hear a faint and wheezy, hey mister, behind me and I presently allowed the old man to catch up and take copious pulls from the quart bottle. I began putting out feelers as we walked along to Water Street and turned southward amidst the omnipresent desolation and crazily tilted ruins, but I found that the aged tongue did not loosen as quickly as I had expected. At length I saw a grass-grown opening toward the sea between crumbling brick walls with the weedy length of an earthen masonry wharf projecting abroad. Piles of moss-covered stones near the water promised tolerable seats, and the scene was sheltered from all possible view by a ruined warehouse on the north. Here, I thought, was the ideal place for a long secret colloquy, so I guided my companion down the lane and picked out spots to sit in among the mossy stones. The air of death and desolation was ghoulish, and the smell of fish almost insufferable, but I was resolved to let nothing deter me. About four hours remained for conversation if I were to catch the eight o'clock coach for Arkham, and I began to dole out more liquor to the ancient tippler, meanwhile eating my own frugal lunch. In my donations, I was careful not to overshoot the mark, for I did not wish Zadok's Venus garrulousness to pass into a stupor. After an hour, his furtive taciturnity showed signs of disappearing, but much to my disappointment, he still sidetracked my questions about Innsmouth and its shadow-haunted past. He would babble of current topics, revealing a wide acquaintance with newspapers and a great tendency to philosophize in a sententious village fashion. Toward the end of the second hour, I feared my quart of whiskey would not be enough to produce results, and was wondering whether I had better leave old Zadok and go back for more. Just then, however, chance made the opening which my questions had been unable to make, and the wheezing anxious rambling took a turn that caused me to lean forward and listen alertly. 
My back was toward the fishy-smelling sea, but he was facing it, and something or other had caused his wandering gaze to light upon the low, distant line of Devil Reef, then showing plainly and almost fascinatingly above the waters. The sight seemed to displease him, for he began a series of weak curses which ended in a confidential whisper and a knowing leer. He bent towards me, took hold of my coat lapel, and hissed out some hints that could not be mistaken. There's where it all begun, that cursed place of all wickedness where the deep water starts. Gate of hell, sheer drop down to the bottom no sound and line can touch. Old Cap'n Obed done it, him that found out more and was good for him in the South Sea Islands. Everyone was in a bad way them days, trade falling off, mills losing business, even the new ones and the best of our men folks killed to privateering in the War of 1812 or lost with the Elysee Brig and the Ranger Snow, both of them Gilman Ventures. Obed Marsh, he had three ships afloat, Brigantine Columbia and Brig Hetty and Bark Sumatri Queen. He was the only one who's kept on with East Inji and Pacific trade, though Esdras Martin's Barkentine Malay pride made a venture as late as 28. Never was nobody like Cap'n Obed, oh, Lima Satan. <laughs> I can mind him a-telling about foreign parts and calling the folks stupid for going to Christian meeting and bearing their burdens meek and lowly. Says they are to get better gods like some of the folks in the Injies. Gods as it bring them good fishing in return for their sacrifices and it really answer folks' prayers. Matt Elliot, his first mate, talked a lot too, only he was against folks doing any heathen things. Told about an island east of Otahite where there was a lot of stone ruins older than anybody knew anything about. Kind of like them on Panape and the Carolines, but with carvings of faces that look like the big statues on Easter Island. There was a little volcanic island near there too, where there was other ruins with different carvings. Ruins all wore away like they'd been under the sea once, and pictures of awful monsters all over them. Well, Sir Matt, he says the natives round there had all the fish they could catch and sported bracelets and armlets and head rigs made out of some queer kind of gold and covered with pictures of monsters just like the ones carved over the ruins on the little island. Sort of fish-like frogs or frog-like fishes that was all drawed in all kinds of positions like they was human beings. Nobody could get out of them where they got all that stuff and all the other natives wondered how they managed to find fish in aplenty when the very next islands had lean pickings. Matt, he got to wondering too, and so did Cap'n Obed. Obed, he notices besides that lots of the handsome young folks had dropped out of sight for good from year to year, and that there weren't many old folks around. Also, he thinks some of the folks looks darn queer even for Kanakis. It took Obed to get the truth out of them heathen. I don't know how he'd done it, but he'd begun by trading for the gold-like things they wore. Asked them where they come from, and if they could get more, and finally he wormed the story out of the old chief, Wallakea, they called him. Nobody but Obed had ever believed a word out of the old yeller devil, but Captain could read folks like they was books. <laughs> Nobody ever believes me now when I tell him, and don't suppose you will either, young feller, but though come to look at you, you have got kind of them sharp reading eyes like old Obed had. <laughs> the old man's whisper grew fainter, and I found myself shuddering at the terrible and sincere portentousness of his intonation, even though I knew his tale could be nothing but drunken fantasy. Well, sir, Obed, he learnt these things on this earth most folks never heard about, and wouldn't believe if they did hear. Seems these Kanakis was sacrificing heaps of their young men and maidens to some of the god things that lived under the sea, and getting all kinds of favor in return. They met the things on the little islet with the queer ruins, and seems the muffled pictures of frogfish monsters were supposed to be pictures of these things. Maybe they was the kind of critters what got all the mermaid stories and such started. They had all kinds of cities at the sea bottom, and this island was heaved up from thar. Seems they was some of the things alive in the stone buildings when the island came up sudden to the surface. That's how the Kanakis got when they was down there. Made sign talk as soon as they got over being scared and pieced together a bargain afore too long. Them things liked human sacrifices, had had them ages afore, but lost track of the upper world after a time. What they done to the victims, it ain't for me to say, and I guess Obed went none too sharp about asking, but uh, it was all right with the heathens, because they'd been having a hard time and was desperate about everything. They gave a certain number of young folk to the sea things twice every year, May Eve and Halloween, regular as could be, and also give some of the carved knickknacks they made. What the things agreed to give in return was plenty of fish, they drove them in from all over the sea, and a few gold-like things every now and again. 
Well, as I says, the natives met the things on the little volcanic islet going there in canoes with the sacrifices, etc., and bringing back any of the gold-like jewels as was coming to them. At first, the things did never go near the main island, but after a time, they come to want to. Seems they hankered after mixing with the folks and having joint ceremonies on the big days, May Eve and Halloween. You see, they was able to live both in and out of the water, what they call amphibians, I guess. The Kanakis told them as how other folks from the other islands might want to wipe them out if they got wind of their being there, but uh, they says they don't care much because they could wipe out the whole brood of humans if they was willing to bother. That is, any as didn't have certain signs, such as what was used once by the old ones, whoever they was. But not wanting to bother, they'd lay low when anybody visited the island. When it come to mating with them toad-looking fishes, the Kanakis kinda balked, but finally they learnt something as to put a new face on the matter. Seems that human folks has got a kind of relation to such water beasts that everything alive come out of the water once and only needs a little change to go back again. Them things told the Kanakis that if they mixed bloods there'd be children as it'd look human at first, but later turn more and more like the things till finally they'd take to the water and join with the main lot of things from down there and this was the important part young feller them as turned into fish things and went into the water wouldn't never die them things never died except as they was kilt violent well sir it seems by the time obed knowed them islanders they was all full of fish blood from the deep water things when they got old and begun to show it they was kept hidden till they felt like taken to the water and quitting the place some was more touched than others, and some never did quite change enough to take to the water, but mostly they turned out just the way them things said. Them as was born more like the things changed hourly, but them as was nearly human sometimes stayed on the island till they was past seventy. Though they'd usually go down under for a few trial trips afore that. Folks as had took to the water generally come back a good deal to visit, so as a man had often be talking to his own five times great grandfather who'd left the dry land a couple of hundred years or so afore. Everybody got out of the idea of dying except in canoe wars with the other islanders or as sacrifices to the sea gods down below or from snake bite or plague or sharp galloping ailments or something before they could take to the water, but simply looked forward to a kind of change that wouldn't have been horrible after a while. They thought what they'd got was well worth what they'd had to give up, and I guess Obed kind of come to thinking the same himself when he chewed over old Wallakea's story a bit. Wallakea, though, was one of a few as hadn't got none of the fish blood being of a royal line that intermarried with royal lines of other islands. Wallakea, he showed Obed a lot of rites and incantations as had to do with the sea things and let him see some of the folks in the villages had changed from human shape. Somehow or other, though, he would never let him see one of the regular things from right out of the water. In the end, he gave him a kind of funny thingamajig made out of lead or something and said it'd bring up the fish things from any place in the water where there might be a nest of them. The idea was to drop it down with the right kind of prayers and such, while Akea allowed as such things was scattered all over the world so as anybody that looked about could find a nest and bring them up if they was wanted. Well, Matt, he didn't like this business at all and wanted Obed should keep away from the island, but the captain was sharp for gain and found he could get them gold-like things so cheap it'd pay him to make a specialty of them. Things went on that way for years. Obed got enough of the gold-like stuff to make him start the refinery and Waits' old run-down fillin' mill. He didn't dare sell the pieces like they was, for folks would be all the time asking questions. All the same as crews would get a good piece of it and dispose of it now and then, and even though they was swore to keep quiet. And he let his woman folks wear some of the pieces as was more human-like than most. Well, come about 38, when I was seven years old, old Bed, he found the island people all wiped out between voyages. Seems the other islanders had gotten wind of what was going on, and it took matters into their own hands. Suppose they must have had, after all, them old magic signs as the sea thing says was the only things they was afeard of. No telling what any of them Kanakis will chance to get a hold of when the sea bottom throws up some island with ruins older than the deluge. Pious cusses they was, they didn't leave nothing standing on either the main island or the little volcanic islet except what parts of the ruins was too big to knock down. In some places there was little stones strewn about like charms, with something on them like what you'd call a swastika nowadays. Probably was one of them old ones signs, folks all wiped out, no trace of no gold dyke things, and none of the nearby Kanakis would breathe a word about the matter, wouldn't even admit they'd ever been any people on that island. That naturally hit Obed pretty hard, seeing as his normal trade was doing very poor. It hit the whole of Innsmouth too, because in seafaring days what profited the master of a ship generally profited the crew proportionate. Most of the folks around town took the hard times kind of sheep-like and resigned, but uh, they was in bad shape because the fishing was petering out and the mills weren't doing none too well. 
Then's the time, Obed, he began a-cursing at them folks for being dull sheep and praying to a Christian heaven as didn't help him none. He told him he know the folks as prayed to gods that could give him something ye really need, and says if a good bunch of men would stand by him, he could maybe get a hold to certain powers and bring plenty of fish and quite a bit of gold. Of course, them as served on the Sumatri Queen and seed the island knowed what he meant, and were none too anxious to get close to the sea things as they'd heard tell on, but uh, them as didn't know what was all about got kind of swayed by what Obed had to say and began to ask them what they could do to set him on the way to the faith as it bring him results. Here the old man faltered, mumbled, and lapsed into a moody and apprehensive silence, glancing nervously over his shoulder and then turning back to stare fascinatedly at the distant black reef. When I spoke to him he did not answer, so I knew I would have to let him finish the bottle. The insane yarn I was hearing interested me profoundly, for I fancied there was contained within it a sort of crude allegory based upon the strangeness of Innsmouth, and elaborated by an imagination at once creative and full of scraps of exotic legend. Not for a moment did I believe that the tale had any real substantial foundation, but nonetheless the account held a hint of genuine terror if only because it brought in references to strange jewels clearly akin to the malign tiara I had seen in Newburyport. Perhaps the ornaments had, after all, come from some strange island, and possibly the wild stories were lies of the bygone Obed himself rather than of this antique toper. I handed Zadok the bottle, and he drained it to the last drop. It was curious how he could stand so much whiskey, for not even a trace of thickness had come into his high, wheezy voice. He licked the nose of the bottle and slipped it into his pocket, then beginning to nod and whisper softly to himself. I bent close to catch any articulate words he might utter and thought I saw a sardonic smile behind the stained, bushy whiskers. Yes, he really was forming words, and I could grasp a fair proportion of them. Poor Matt. Matt, he always was against it. Tried to line up folks on his side and had long talks with the preachers. No use. They ran the congressional parson out of town and the Methodist feller quit and never did see Resolve Babcock, the Baptist parson, again. Wrath of Jehovah. It was a mighty little critter, but I heard what I heard and seen what I seen. Dagon and Ashtoreth, Belial and Beelzebub, Golden Calf and the idols of Canaan, the Philistines, Babylonish abominations, meany, meany, tickly parson. He stopped again, and from the look in his watery blue eyes, I feared he was close to a stupor after all. But when I gently shook his shoulder, he turned on me with astonishing alertness and snapped out some more obscure phrases. Don't believe me, hey? Then just tell me, young feller, why Captain Obed and twenty-odd other folks used to row out to Devil Reef in the dead of night and chant things so loud you could hear them all over town when the wind was right? Tell me that, hey. And tell me why Obed was always dropping heavy things down into the deep water on the other side of the reef where the bottom shoots down like a cliff lower than you can sound. Tell me what he'd done with that funny-shaped lead thingamajig as well as Kea gave him, hey boy? And what did they used to howl on May Eve and again on the next Halloween? And why did the new church parsons, fellers as used to be sailors, wear them queer robes and cover themselves with them gold-like things Obed brung, hey? The watery blue eyes were almost savage and maniacal now, and the dirty white beard bristled electrically. Old Zadok probably saw me shrink back, for he'd begun to cackle evilly. <laughs> beginning to see, hey? Maybe it'd like to have been me back in them days when I'd seen things at night out to sea from the couple o' top of my house. <laughs> I can tell you, little pictures have big ears, and I wasn't missing nothing of what was gossiped about Captain Obed and the folks out to the reef. <laughs> How about the night I took my pa's ship's glass up to the cupolo and see the reef a-bristling thick with shapes that dove off quick soon as the moon's riz? Obed and the folks was in a dory, but them shapes dove off the far side into the deep water and never come up. How'd you like to be a little shaver alone up in a cupolo watching the shapes that want human shapes? <laughs> the old man was getting hysterical, and I began to shiver with a nameless alarm. He laid a gnarled claw on my shoulder, and it seemed to me that its shaking was not altogether that of mirth. Suppose one night you'd see it something heavy heaved off an Obed's dory beyond the reef and then learn the next day a young feller was missing from home, hey? Did anybody ever see Hyde nor Hare a Hiram Gilman again, did they? And Nick Pierce and Llewelly Waite and Adoniram Southwick and Henry Garrison, hey? <laughs> Ships tucking sign language with their hands. Them as had real hands. 
Well, sir, that was the time Obed began to get on his feet again. Folks see his three daughters are wearing gold-like things as nobody had ever seen on them before, and smoke started coming out of the refinery chimbley, and other folks was prospering too. Fish began to swarm up into the harbor fit to kill, and heaven knows what size cargoes we began to ship out to Newburyport and Arkham and Boston. Twas then Obed got the old branch railroad put through, and some Kingsport fishermen heard about the catch and came up in sloops, but <laughs> they was all lost. Nobody never seen him again. And just then our folks organized the esoteric order at Dagon and bought Masonic Hall off in Calvary Commandery for it. <laughs> Matt Elliot was a mason and against the selling, but he dropped out of sight just then. <laughs> Now remember, I ain't saying Obed was set on having things just like they was on that Kanaki Isle. I, I don't think he aimed at first to do no mixin' nor raise no youngins to take to the water and turn into the fishes with eternal life. He just wanted them gold things and was willing to pay heavy, and I guess the uh, others were satisfied for a while. Huh. Come in 46, the town done some looking and thinking for itself. Too many folks missing, too much wild preaching at a meeting on a Sunday. Too much talk about that reef. I guess I done a bit by telling Selectman Maori what I seen from the Copolo. There was a party one night as Father Obed's crowd out to the reef, and I heard shots betwixt the dories. Next day Obed and thirty-two sailors was in jail, and everybody a wondering just what was afoot and just what charge against him could be got to halt. God if anybody had a looked ahead a couple of weeks later when nothing had been thrown into the sea for that long. Zadok was showing signs of fright and exhaustion, and I let him keep silence for a while, though glancing apprehensively at my watch. The tide had turned and was coming in now, and the sound of the waves seemed to arouse him. I was glad of that tide, for at high water the fishy smell might not be so bad. Again, I strained to catch his whispers. That awful night. I seed him. I was up on the couple of of them, swarms of them, all over the reef, swimming up to the harbor in the middle of the God, what happened in the streets of it all that night? They rattled our door, but Pa wouldn't open. He clung out the kitchen window with his musket to find Selector and Maori and see what he could do. Mountains of the dead and dying, shots, screams, shouting in the old squire and town squire and new church. Jail, throw it open, proclamation, treason. Called it the plagues when the folks come in and found half our people missing. Nobody left but them as a giant in with Obed and them things, or else keep quiet. Never hear to my pa no more. The old man was panting and perspiring profusely. His grip on my shoulder tightened. Everything cleaned up in the morning, but there was traces. Obed, he kind of takes charge and says things is going to be changed. Others will worship with us at meeting time, and certain houses has got to entertain guests. They wanted to mix like they'd done with the Kanakis, and he, for one, didn't feel bound to stop them. Far gone was Obed, just like a crazy man on the subject. He says they brung us fish and treasure, and they should have whatever they hankered after. Nothing was to be different on the outside, only we was to keep shy of strangers if we knowed what was good for us. We all had to take the oath of Dagon, and later there was second and third oaths that some of us took. Them as it helps special, it gets special rewards, gold and such. No use bulking, for they was millions of them down there. They'd rather not start rising up and wiping out humankind, but if they was given away and forced to, they could do a lot towards just that. We didn't have them old charms to cut them off like the folks in the South Sea did, and them Kanakis would never give up their secrets. Yield up enough sacrifices and savage knickknacks and harborage in the town when they wanted it, and they'd let well enough alone. Wouldn't bother no strangers as might bear tales outside, but that is without they got prying. All in the bond of the faithful, order a Dagon, and the children should never die, but go back to the Mother Hydra and Father Dagon, what we all come from once, Ia, Ia, Cthulhu Fatagan, Fenguli Magnoafa, Cthulhu Rilea, Wignal Fatagan. Old Zadok was fast lapsing into stark raving, and I held my breath. Poor old soul. 
to what pitiful depths of hallucination had his liquor, plus his hatred of the decay, alienage, and disease around him brought that fertile, imaginative brain. He began to moan now, and tears were coursing down his channeled cheeks into the depths of his beard. Just what I seen since I was fifteen year old. Meany, meany, tell you parson. The folks as was missing and them that killed themselves. Them as told things in Arkham or Ipswich or such places were all called crazies or a calling me now. God, what I've seen. They'd have killed me long ago for what I know, but I took the first and second oath set Dagon off an old bed and so was protected unless in a jury of them proved I was told things known and deliberate, but I wouldn't take the third oath. I'd have died rather. Take that. Got worse around Civil War time when children born since 46 began to grow up, and some of them, that is. I was afeard. Never did no prying after that awful night. Never seen one of them close to in all my life. That is, never no full blooded one. I went to the war, and if I had any guts or sense, I'd have never come back and settled away from here, but. Folks wrote me things weren't so bad. That, I suppose, was because government draft men was in town after 63. After the war, it was just as bad again. People began to fall off, mills and shops shut down. Shipping stopped and the harbor choked up, railroad give up, but they... They never stopped swimming in and out of the river from that cursed reef of Satan. And more and more attic winders got to board it up, and more and more noises was heard in houses as wasn't supposed to have nobody in them. Folks outside of their stories about us, suppose you heard plenty of them, seeing as what questions you asked. Stories about things they'd seen now and then, about that queer jewelry as comes in from somewheres and ain't quite all melted up, but nothing ever gets definite. Nobody will believe nothing. They called them gold-like things, pirate loot, and allow the Innsmouth folks has foreign blood or is distempered or something. Beside them's that lives here shoo off as many strangers as they can and encourage the rest not to get very curious, especially around night time. Beasts balk at the critters, hosses worse than mules, but when they got autos that was all right. In 46, Cop and Obed took a second wife that nobody in town never see. Some says he didn't want to, but was made to by them as he called in. Had three children by her. Two has disappeared young, but one girl has looked like anyone else and was educated in Europe. Obed finally got her married off by a trick to an Arkham feller as didn't suspect nothing, but nobody outside will have nothing to do with Innsmouth folk now. Barnabas Marsh that runs the refinery now is Obed's grandson by his first wife, son of Onesephorus, his eldest son, but his mother was another of them as one never seen outdoors. Right now, Barnabas is about changed, can't shed his eyes no more, and is all out of shape. They say he still wears clothes, but he'll take to the water soon. Maybe he's tried it already, they do that sometimes, go down for little spells before they go for good. Ain't been seen about in public for nigh on ten year. Don't know how his poor wife can feel, she come from Ipswich, and they near lynched Barnabas when he courted her fifty odd year ago. Oh... Obed, he died in 78, and all the next generation's gone now. First wife's children dead, and the rest... God knows. The sound of the incoming tide was now very insistent, and little by little it seemed to change the old man's mood from maudlin tearfulness to watchful fear. He would pause now and then to renew those nervous glances over his shoulder or out towards the reef, and despite the wild absurdity of his tale, I could not help begin to share in his vague apprehensiveness. Zadok now grew shriller, and seemed to be trying to whip up his courage with louder speech. Hey you, why don't you say something? How'd you like to be living in a town like this, with everything a rotten and a dying and boarded up monsters crawling and bleating and barking and hopping around black cellars and attics every which way you turn, hey? How'd you like to hear the howling night after night from the churches in order to dig on hall and know what's doing part of the howling? How'd you like to hear what comes from that awful reef every May Eve and Halamas, hey? Think the old man's crazy, eh? Well, sir, let me tell ya, that ain't the worst. Zadok was really screaming now, and the mad frenzy of his voice disturbed me more than I care to own. Curse ye, don't ya sit there staring at me with them eyes. I tell Obed Marsh he's in hell, and he's gotta stay there. In hell, I says, can't get me, I ain't done nothing nor told nobody nothing. Oh, you young feller, well, 
Even if I ain't told nobody nothing yet, I'm a going to now. You just sit still and listen to me, boy. This is what I ain't never told nobody. I says I didn't do no prying after that night, but I found things out just the same. You want to know what the real horror is, hey? Well, it's this. It ain't what them fish devils has done, but it's what they're gonna do. They're bringing things up out of where they come from into town, been doing it for years and slacking up lately. Them houses north of the river betwixt water and main streets is full of them. Them devils and what they brung up and what they get ready. I say, and when they get ready, ever hear tell of a shogoth? Hey, do you hear me? I tell you, I know what them things be. I seen them one night when... <laughs> the hideous suddenness and inhuman frightfulness of the old man's shriek almost made me faint. His eyes, looking past me towards the malodorous sea, were positively starting from his head, while his face was a mask of fear worthy of Greek tragedy. His bony claw dug monstrously into my shoulder, and he made no motion as I turned my head to look at whatever he had glimpsed. There was nothing that I could see, only the incoming tide, with perhaps one set of ripples more local than the long-flung line of breakers. But now Zadok was shaking me, and I turned back to watch the melting of that fear-frozen face into a chaos of twitching eyelids and mumbling gums. Presently his voice came back, albeit as a trembling whisper. Get out of here! Get out of here! They seen us! Get out of your life! Don't wait for nothing! They know now! Run for it quick! Out of this town! <sighs> Another heavy wave dashed against the loosening masonry of the bygone wharf and changed the mad ancient's whisper into another inhuman and blood-curdling scream. Before I could recover my scattered wits, he had relaxed his clutch on my shoulder and dashed wildly inland towards the street, reeling northward around the ruined warehouse wall. I glanced back at the sea, but there was nothing there, and when I reached Water Street and looked along it toward the north, there was no remaining trace of Zadok Allen.